this morning's first scripture reading from the wonderful book of Psalms. I'll be reading the 43rd Psalm. And if you're using a red church Bible, that's on page 551. Again, Psalm 43 on page 551. And the psalmist writes, Vindicate me, my God, and plead my cause against an unfaithful nation. Rescue me from those who are deceitful and wicked. You are God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? Send me your light and your faithful care. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my joy and my delight. I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. May the Lord add his blessing. This morning's second scripture reading, continuing in the Old Testament, from the book of 1 Samuel. I'll be reading the first 20 verses of the 30th chapter. And if again, if you're using a red church Bible, that's on page 291. Again, page 291, the first 20 verses of the 30th chapter of 1 Samuel. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it, and had taken captive the women and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men reached Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire, and their wives, sons, and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives, who had been captured, Ahiram of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Then David sent to Abathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Abathar brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. David and the 600 men with him came to the Bezor Valley where they stayed behind. 200 of them were too exhausted to cross the valley, but David and the other 400 continued the pursuit. They found an Egyptian in a field and brought him to David. They gave him water to drink and food to eat, part of a cake of pressed figs and two cakes of raisins. He ate and was revived, for he had not eaten any food or drunk any water for three days and three nights. David asked him, who do you belong to? Where do you come from? He said, I am an Egyptian, the, slaves, the slave of an Amalekite. My master abandoned me when I became ill three days ago. We raided the Negev of the Karathites, some territory belonging to Judah and the Negev of Cable, and we burned Ziklag. David asked him, 
Can you lead me down to this raiding party? He answered, Swear to me before God that you'll not kill me or hand me over to my master, and I'll take you down to them. He led David down, and there they were, scattered over the countryside, eating, drinking, and reveling because of the great amount of plunder they had taken from the land of the Philistine and from Judah. David fought them from dusk until the evening of the next day, and none of them got away except 400 young men who rode off in camels and fled. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder, or anything else they had taken. David brought everything back. He took all the flocks and herds, and his men drove them ahead of the other livestock, saying, this is David's plunder. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Hey, hey, hey. did real good pronouncing the word Amalekites. Thank you. <laughs> I'm very proud of you. <laughs> There's a lot of words that are tough, and it gets tougher as you get older. Uh, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, open our hearts uh, to what you've laid upon my heart and this scripture, and we give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, this morning, folks, I, I want to talk to you about encouraging ourselves in the Lord. Uh, with, with all the craziness that's happening in our country and the world, it's a timely message. It's always a timely message, and, but it's something that we need to learn to do, and it's something that we need to do. Now, Nahum the prophet, in chapter 1, verse 7, wrote, The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. Encouraging ourselves in the Lord is taking refuge in the Lord. It's taking refuge through prayer, through scripture, drawing on our experiences, uh, past and present in God, and realizing that we have a broken union, uh, an unbroken union, through, with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's very, very important to understand these things. Now, last week, we looked at John chapter 6. And we talked about, you know, remember the disciples were in the boat, and there were a lot of obstacles and headwinds, but we talked about how God orders and provides various events. Um, and he's, we talked about how he's the bread of life, the great I am. We're going to see that same theme again here this morning that God orders and provides, but we're going to see it kind of like with a little bit different twist. In John chapter 6, Jesus shows up and he walks on the water, right? In 1 Samuel 30, David sought God out. God still showed up, you see? Kind of like two sides to the same coin somewhat, but God shows up when the disciples are in the boat and at their wit's end. In this particular case, David's at his wit's end, and he seeks God. You see? Now, this, this passage here in first I love the Old Testament, because the narratives are absolutely off the charts. And, you know, a lot of times, certain things are implied. And, you know, you, you kind of like almost just walk to the very edge without going over the edge in terms of how you interpret but this passage needs, needs some context. And it, this event comes about through a number of extenuating circumstances. Now, if we had the time this morning to read 1 Samuel chapter 22 through 1 Samuel 30, then we could kind of funnel it all and, and bring it together. Now, because we don't have the time, I'm going to uh, attempt to summarize this, okay? So, uh, David is living in Philistine territory because Saul is trying to kill him. And recall Saul was jealous 
You know, Saul killed thousands, David killed tens of thousands, and Saul was eventually disobedient before God, and God sent an evil spirit, and he was afflicted by that evil spirit, and he attempted to kill David on numerous occasions. So David finally decides, after another attempt, he finally decides, I'm going off to live with the Philistines because he won't seek me there, he won't pursue me there. Now remember, David was also anointed to be king in 1 Samuel 16. So that was a big issue to Saul, all right? Now, so living in the Philistine territory kind of presents this uh, an unusual situation. So as David's living there, he's serving uh, the Philistine lord Achish. And what he's doing is he's conducting raids and he's getting spoils from war. And he's giving some of those spoils to the Philistine lord. It's kind of like a, a win-win situation, right? But here's the thing that you don't get from the text here. You only get it in chapter 27 of 1 Samuel. David duped the Philistine lord into believing that he was a very, very loyal subject. And so when David conducted raids, you know, Achish would say, well, where did you raid today, David? And David would say, very generally, well, in the Negev or in this territory, in that territory. And he would mention areas where the Jewish people lived. You see? But what he was actually doing, he was raiding, raiding Amalekite settlements in the areas where Jewish people lived. And so David is playing both ends against the middle here, right? Just as a side note, in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, when Saul fought against the Amalekites, he never killed their king. That was another act of disobedience that, where he fell out of God's favor. So, so David's playing both ends against the middle, feigning loyalty. He's killing all the Amalekites when he goes into raid. Men, women, children. Uh, pretty brutal. But what he's essentially doing is conducting holy war. war. And this is providing cover for him so he can hang out in Philistine territory. So one of them would not go back and say, hey, <laughs> David's not killing Jews, he's killing Amalekites. You see? Now, uh, so what happens here is David and his men were giving the city of Ziklag as their own place for their families, right? And that's where they would stage the raids. And then, they, again, they would share the spoils of war with the Philistine lord. But David was very sharp because someday he knew that he would be king. He also sent some off to the elders in Judah. You see? Very, very wise. And you can pick that up uh, if you were to read the second half or the latter portion of chapter 30. David did that. So... This is the situation. It's inevitable at some point that David would, have to, would be asked by the Philistines to go to war against the Israelites because they were enemies and constantly fought against one another, right? So Achish says to David one day, hey, we're going out to fight the Israelites and you're going to come with me, right? And David's like, oh yeah, absolutely, I'm loyal to you. That's a problem for David. And so what happens, if you, if, you, if you were to read some of the earlier accounts, Achish is following behind the main thrust of the army, and David's riding along with him. And a fortuitous event happens. David is actually asked to leave the battle and go back to Ziklag. And the reason for that is because some of the Philistine lords didn't like the fact that David had with bringing up the rear. And they said to Achish, we can't trust this guy. So Achish reluctantly says to David, look, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to go home. You know, and if you're David, you're like, Phew. praise God, right? Praise God, because that would have been a problem for David. Now, so his men go back to Ziklag, and what do they find? That's the account that we have here. Very, very important. We've, they find a burned city, they find all their loved ones captured, and these guys are absolutely distraught. They want to kill David. Talk about being between a rock and a hard place, right? 
And so it, it's, it, it, that helps us to put this passage into its context. But here's the other thing, too, uh, that I want to uh, do. I, I, we need to look at the chapter context here, too, because uh, we don't necessarily see this when we read this chapter, but Scripture's giving us a contrast between King Saul and soon-to-be King David. They're both in distress. God has left King Saul. And David is between the rock and the hard place. And it's interesting, but scholars believe that this actually happened on the same day, where they're both in distress. And I want to kind of summarize for you um, the responses between the two men, right? Because they're both seeking advice. Uh, remember I said to you earlier that uh, God is no longer answering King Saul because of his disobedience. Remember he sacrificed and, and when he should have waited for Samuel and then he didn't kill the Malachite king when he should have. So, so what does Saul do? He goes to a medium in 1 Samuel 28. Now, mediums were forbidden in the land. They, they consult with the dead. It's, it's basically going to people who do seances and horoscopes and you know, try to bring back, you know, spirits, uh, deceased spirits, right? Uh, scripture forbids that. So that was, that was Saul's response to getting advice. David, the, the account tells us here, um, sought the Lord through the Urim and Thummim. Now that, the Urim and Thummim is kind of a, uh, kind of a mysterious kind of thing, but let me s at least give you um, the sense of what scholars know to be true about it. It was a device that the high priest wore, and it was referred to as an ephod, and we're going to see that in verse 7. David says to Abiathar, the, the priest, bring me the ephod. Well, it's kind of like a flak jacket, or kind of like a, an apron that you would put over your head and cover you front and back, right? And it had pockets, and you would have 12 stones of Israel hanging in those pockets. And they also say that there's 12 stones, uh, six, two stones on each shoulder, representing six tribes on the one side and six on the other. And so that's the Urim and Thummim. And when, when somebody wanted to know the will of God regarding a particular matter, you would say to the priest, hey, go get me the ephod or the Urim and Thummim, right? And so what David is doing here, he wants to know the will of God regarding what he should do with his loved ones and the loved ones of, his, of his, uh, his men. And so God is answering David and he's not answering Saul. That's a huge contrast here, folks, as you take a look at the chapter context, right? Just as another little side note, if I can, Abiathar, the son of the high priest, escaped with the ephod you can read about it in 1 Samuel 22. And he took the Urim and Thummim, the ephod, because King Saul killed all of the Lord's priests at Nob in his quest to go after David. Because remember, the high priest had helped David escape, and he gave him bread from the tabernacle, right? So this all kind of ties together, right? Here's the other contrast that you won't see in the passage that Dave just read in chapter 30. So Saul goes to the medium, he gets bad news, and he's totally drained of heart and strength. And, and, he, and he can't even seem to eat. David gets bad news, and the scripture says he strengthens his heart in the Lord. What a tremendous contrast between two men, one soon to be king, one king, one worldly and ungodly, and one godly. And here's another contrast here. David's response and his men's response. Now, if you notice, all were grief-stricken. I mean, David was in this with them too. They all cried where they couldn't cry any longer. You ever cry where, to the point where you just can't find any more tears in your tear ducts to cry? been there. They're all warriors. I mean, these guys are, they're men's men. You know, they're warriors, right? <laughs> Go figure. What do they want to do to David? They want to kill him. 
uh, <laughs> when they probably needed him most, they want to kill him. If you, and this is a really, really interesting contrast here, not maybe contrast, but if you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 2, all this ragtag group that de decided to follow David, they were distraught, they were debt in debt, uh, they were in despair, uh, they were in despair of a state of mind in life, and they didn't care anymore, and they took up with David. This is a ragtag group, you know? Probably, I don't know, um, probably not that you would find in the hallmarks of society, right? Well, if you take a look at verse 6, it says that they were embittered of soul, almost to the sense that they returned to the state of mind and heart and disposition before they took up with David. I mean, they didn't care. And all they wanted to do was kill them. And actually, the word means that they were afflicted to the point where they wanted to do physical harm. So, what does David do? I mean, these people are disloyal. I mean, by every right, maybe he should have run them through. Could have, could have run them through with the sword. He doesn't. Uh, what does David do? He doesn't seek revenge like they want to. But his love and his care for them is shown. He goes to God. He handles it in a very, very godly way. He seeks God's help. Uh, this, David was greatly distressed, the scripture says. Um, it means frustrated in a state of anxiety and fear. Uh, we've all been frustrated. I've been very frustrated lately with what's going on. Very, very frustrated. We've all been a state, in a state of anxiety at some point, anxious about something. Fearful. Everyone's fearful about something. David's love and his care for these people doesn't waver. Now, this is what I want you to see. You take a look at the two responses, right? This is a classic response between the flesh and the spirit, right? The spirit of God works in David. The spirit of the flesh works in the... And then what they do is they default to what they know. These killers want to kill. And David, even though he's a killer, he's a man of God. He's a warrior, but he goes to God, you see? What a great, great contrast here. Uh, David chose grace. They show unbridled passions. Uh, you know, they want to get rid of their leader. God goes to the ultimate leader. Now, I, I wanted to set this all up so we can appreciate David's response here, that he encouraged himself in the Lord. And I said earlier, this is something we all need to learn to do, and we need, we need to do it on a regular basis. So let's talk about what, what it means to encourage ourselves in the Lord. I want to first start by giving you a sense of what this word means <clears throat> in 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. It means to be strong, strengthened, courageous, to overpower. Now, take a look at verse 4, because the word strengthened is also used, or um, it said, no, actually, the word strength uh, is, is used. Um, they wept until there was no strength in them. In verse 4, that is primarily for physical strength. In verse 6, that word can be used to physical strength, but it's way more than that. It's inner strength. It's intestinal fortitude, as we would say. It's drawing on one's, um, you know, like inner spirit. That's what it is. And, and this is another thing that I thought was really, really interesting. So the grammatical construction is such that you can have God strengthen David or David strengthened himself in God. Now, why is it I, just about like all, most of all the translations take the latter, David strengthened himself? Why is that? Now, I want you to think about it. When we seek God... That's what he does, right? Now, he may do it when we don't seek him, but when we seek God, that's what he does. He strengthens his people. Uh, this same word, I found it amazing. The same word is when Jacob met Esau. Remember Esau? 
Uh, he thought Esau was going to kill him. Because that's what Esau said 20 years earlier. I'm going to kill you the next time I see you. Uh, this same word was used when Moses was facing the Red Sea and they had the Egyptians at his back. This same word was used in Joshua 1. In verse 6, when God charged Joshua, he said, be strong and courageous. And the same word was also the same word in verse 9 that Joshua said to the people, be strong and courageous. Uh, this same word was used when David killed Goliath. And it was also used when Samson pulled down the pillars as his last great feat and act. And, of course, he knew that he would kill himself, too. That's, that's an amazing thing. And, and that gives us great insight in, into how the scriptures present encouraging ourselves in the Lord. It's spiritual assessment, folks. It's drawing on inner strength. It's harnessing the power of godly thought. It's negating the negatives in a situation with the positive of God. It's trusting God. And, and, you know, and I, it, it essentially amounts to self-counsel. You know, we see that in Psalm 43. Why are you in despair, O my soul? That's self-counsel, right? You know, a lot of times people run off to counselors, and I suppose that they have their place, you know, just like doctors do and medication does. But self-counsel has its place, too. You know, uh, what did they say? It's okay if you talk to yourself, right? Just don't answer yourself, right? Don't, you can answer yourself too. Just don't let people hear that you answer yourself, right? So it's, it's talking to ourselves and talking through the situation when we're in a pickled situation. When we're in a place between a rock and a heart and we don't see the answer, it's, it's talk, and, and, and talking to God and working it through, that's what it is. David was in a real pickle. Listen to what one scholar said. I, I think it kind of puts it in perspective. Saul had driven him from his country. The Philistines had driven him from their camp. The Amalekites had plundered his city. His wives were taken prisoners. And now, to his complete woe, to complete his woe, his own familiar friends in whom he trusted, in whom he had sheltered, and who he did eat bread with, instead of sympathizing with him and offering him any grief, lifted up their heel against him and threatened to stone him. Now, folks, I, I, was, I was looking at that and I was saying, I've never been in a situation like that, praise God. I've ne have you? That's a, that's a tough situation. And, and, and David exercised great, great trust. Great, great trust. Great faith. Now, these circumstances here, and I, and I recounted the entire account to help you know, to give you a sense that David put himself in this situation with some of his own doing. But God allowed that to happen. It's providential. Now, here's the other thing I, I want you to notice. Uh, the scripture says that David was greatly distressed. This is huge. He did not continue to let the negative prevail in his heart and his mind. He overcame it. Now, you know, some will talk about the power of positive thinking, and you see this in a lot of religious circles. Uh, and it's been known to work. You know, you can tell yourself stuff, and, and you, can, you, know, you can work your way out of it. But here's the difference. Positive thinking that is not rooted and grounded in God is idolatrous. It's in self. The source is suspect. It's not of God. I, I talked about the power of positive thinking several months ago when we first went into this coronavirus thing. And I would stand up here and we would do the tapes on the platform here. You know, the power of positive thinking is, it works. But when it's in God, it really works. And it's, and it's right. Uh, as a man thinks, so he is. Proverbs 23, verse 7. You know, you constantly think negative thoughts. I constantly think negative thoughts. Not only are we going to be down... It's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
David wasn't doing the power of positive thinking secularly, but he was doing it divinely. He went to God. He defaulted to God, not to his own mind and his own power. He sought God out. He sought the Urim and Thummim, which is uh, the divine will of God. It, 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 he went to Abiathar, the priest, the high priest, uh, in the line of succession for high priest. It would be like going to Christ. Uh, Urim and Thummim, Urim and Thummim would be the modern day prayer and scripture and seeking the Holy Spirit for an answer. God was his source. So I, I looked at this passage and I would say, what does a modern day David do? Because we're, we're modern day Davids, all right? Sorry, women, you're Davids, okay? And what do you do? You ask and you seek and you knock. You seek God in it all, right? Uh, you seek God's heart and will for answers. You find strength in the Word of God scripturally. You find strength in Christ relationally. Uh, it, you know, prayer and Scripture and Christ are Christ's spirit. Uh, it's the Yoram and Thummim of the day. We go to God. I, I want to read some Scriptures for you that have given me great, great comfort. I think they have for you too. Let me, uh, because this is part of encouraging ourselves in the Lord. Uh, Romans 8.26, in the same way the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, as I said earlier. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings uh, too deep for words. Uh, God's on top of the situation. He knows it, right? Thank God. Because there's a lot of times where, I mean, I was sitting this morning, I was praying, and I said to my wife, I was, my mind was traveling, I was distracted, and I didn't really kind of know how to pray. Uh, Romans 8.28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Not some things, not a little things, not just the, the big things or the few things, but all things, right? He's got it. Uh, Romans 8, um, 29 through 31, this is about you. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, that he would be the firstborn among many brethren, and these whom he predestined he also called, these he called he also justified, these whom he justified he also glorified. Man, I, that just puts like some lift under, under my, in, in my sails, under my wings, some, some wind in my sails. God's, God's changing us from glory to glory, and he's using all these events. Uh, Romans, I mean, notice I'm in Romans 8, great, great passage, uh, verses 31 through 34. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? The Amalekites? The Hittites? The whateverites? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justified. Is justified. So God hasn't turned on us. He's working through it. The situation. He's starting, he's finishing what he started. He's going to complete it. Uh, Romans 8.35, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Or your current situation? Your current dilemma? The rock in the hard place? I don't think so. Uh, Romans 8.39, but in all these things we are overwhelmingly we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us, for I am convinced that neither life nor death, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I could end with that. I'm not. Brothers and sisters, these, these scriptures are all intended to encourage us in God. That's what they were written for, for our benefit. Romans 15, 4. They're given for self-counsel. They're given to get us through the pickle so we can mount up on eagle's wings, so we can soar 
And so we run and do not grow weary. It's to deflect the negative and the evil and the ungodliness and the passions, the unbridled passions at times that want to kind of rear up. Very quickly, David's men, I want you to see this contrast here. They had great stamina. When they marched from Ziklag with Akesh and they brought up the rear in the Philistine army, it was a three-day march. They were into the march three days before they were asked to turn around. And so they turn around and they march another three days. So they march six days straight. They come back. They're just depleted emotionally because their loved ones are gone. They're, everything is burned up, right? So they, now they physically pursue even more. It's more time on the march, right? And then they fought all day and all night. But did you notice that only 400 of the 600 fought all day and all night? Who had the oil, so to speak, in their lamps? Who had enough? Deep down within, 400 of the 600. It's not only the physical fight, it's the emotional, it's the spiritual, it's the mental. And, and David led the way. And David was in the, the most difficult circumstance of them all. You know, when I was a young believer and I read the Old Testament scriptures, I was just enthralled with David. You know, I, I thought he was the greatest leader. Until Earl Scholl, um, the spiritual, a uh, great, great guy. I mean, this guy had a sixth grade education, like Apollo. Apollos, mighty in the scriptures, so humble. Uh, he was just a great, great saint to me. And um, he said to me one day, Moses was greater than David. It's like, oh yeah, <laughs> right? <laughs> Moses was greater, right? Um, and then, uh, but what about Peter and James and John? And what about St. Paul? Uh, Paul writes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Read 2 Corinthians 12 sometime and see what the Apostle Paul went through. How God used him for the church and were the benefits of it, the recipients of it. Uh, you know, folks, this is a mindset. It's reminding ourselves you're overcomers. You're in the beloved. Grace, love, mercy, goodness, hope, confidence. It's been shed abroad in your hearts. That's, you know, these truths should go a, a very, very long way. Amen? They should. I would suggest to you that this is what David did. He took the scriptures. He took his experiences in God. And, and he, prayer. And he, and he brought it all to harness in, in this moment. Uh, what, did David, did, what did David write in Psalm 139? Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. Uh, you know my rising up and my sitting. You, 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 you understand my thoughts. You don't want to go in when I come out. You know everything there is about me. Uh, here you go, Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? Uh, David knew all this. He wrote it through the Spirit of God. The psalmist, it, take a look at Psalm 42 sometime. He, Why are you in despair? Hope in God. Uh, the psalmist says... Um, Therefore I remember you from the land of the Jordan, from the peaks of Hermon, the Mount, from Mount Mizmar. It's drawing on what God has done in your life. That's what it is. I want you to stop for a minute, and I'm almost done. Stop, stop for a minute and consider the stress that you're under. But what about the stress that David was under? We don't even come close to this kind of daily stress. His life hung in the balance. He was a warrior on regular raids. He was a wanted man. He had to lie to a guy that would have killed him. Holy war, deceit. He lived with a bunch of warriors and killers. He had a lot to balance. And I believe that David drew on God's promises. Remember that God made a covenant with King David? Right? What was it? 
You're going to be king, and your son, one of your, one of your sons will sit on the throne forever. David was no different than Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses. That's what they all did. They drew on the promises of God. I leave you with a final thought. All this happened just before David ascended to the throne. You know, sometimes things kind of get really, really bad before everything lifts, right? I think that that's the situation here. Sometimes things get really, really bad just before God shows up. and let, We saw that last week, didn't we? Disciples in the boat, they're not going, and all of a sudden God shows up. Same situation here. May we be ever mindful that just when we're at our wit's end, when we think it's the worst, God's showing up. And um, may we encourage ourselves in the Lord as David did. Um, there's a difference between light and darkness. And um, we have all the tools right here to do it. Amen? Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, may we, each and every one of us, uh, draw great, great strength from our relationship with Christ. And may we understand that we have union with you, Lord, that you are for us and not against us. May we draw great, great strength in times of prayer. May we draw great strength from knowing that when we struggle to pray, your Holy Spirit uh, is there to properly pray for each and every situation that we struggle in. And also, Lord, too, uh, may we go to your scriptures and, and in your word, may we... Um, find great comfort and strength and peace and solace and consolation of our hearts. And um, Lord, may you give us um, uh, great understanding that we're overcomers uh, by your great grace for what you've given us in Christ. Uh, may we learn from uh, our experiences for when you showed up. May we um, have the grace to put that in our, uh, our memory bank to know uh, that you're going to deliver. Uh, we thank you for this time this morning. Uh, we bless you that Christ makes it all possible. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.